This is the absolute perfect storm, worst case time slot, I think, in, in any conference ever. Um, it's the last slot on the last day. It's right before lunch, either of which would be bad, but combined. And then to make matters worse, they already have lunch set up outside, so even before the talk's supposed to start. So uh, I appreciate the determination of all of you who actually came and stuck with it. And, and so you must really want to hear what I have to say here today. So, so, uh, um, um, so DevSecOps is forecast to grow to billions of dollars in the industry in the next few years. So the analysts have published that information. So the tool vendors and the service providers and the framework designers have all basically said, huh, I want to ride that wave. And they've added DevSecOps to their label. Some of them can make the claim in a valid way that they can really follow the concept of DevOps and really add security into that. Many of them, however, it's just marketing hype. And it's sometimes hard to tell the difference when you're working with, with those folks. So this talk is, is really twofold. It's a little bit of an introduction into what I think of as DevSecOps. Um, and so has anyone, has anyone here come to my talk yesterday, which was really more deeply on? So most of you. OK, so that's, a, that's interesting. I only have about five or six slides that overlap with that. But seeing that there's you know, over half of you were at my talk yesterday, I will breeze through those and spend mostly, almost all the time on, on tools here. So the talk yesterday and, and a little bit of t today's talk is really about sort of my vision for what DevSecOps really is. And then the rest, the bulk of the talk today, is really more focused on tool vendors and, and how tools that really do this well uh, are different than tools that don't. Um, so I'm going to focus mostly on security tools, but a lot of what I have to say will make sense for non-security tools as well. So a little bit about my background. This is one of the five or six slides that's going to duplicate from yesterday. Graduated from Virginia Tech, electrical computer engineering degree. Started my first business while I was still an undergrad at Tech. Grew it to 80 employees, 20 million a year in, in business. And our number one customer was GE Power Generation. We wrote the software that controlled 60% of the world's power generation. So if, if we had vulnerabilities or quality problems in our software, that could be disastrous for the world's power grid. We got very good at writing very high quality software with very low vulnerabilities, and we developed a framework um, with which to do that. I actually spun the framework out as another business. That business got noticed by the folks at Carnegie Mellon, um, and they wanted to uh, essentially say, uh, come to Carnegie Mellon. Your business is established to change the world. We think you can do a better job of changing the world if you establish a research consortium here at Carnegie Mellon with this uh, framework. And so that's what I did. I, I, I sold out of my business. It's, both of those businesses are still in, in, uh, alive today and thriving. Um, but I no longer am involved in them. I went to Carnegie Mellon. I started working on a PhD there, and I launched the Scilab, helped launch the Scilab there at Carnegie Mellon, the cybersecurity lab there. Um, after seven years at Carnegie Mellon, though, I, I became a little disgruntled. We did, we did have a little bit of success. We launched this Build Security In initiative uh, with Gary McGraw and, and, and Nuper Davis, who's now the Chief Information Security Officer for Comcast, where I work. Uh, but, but it didn't really take off. And so I left Carnegie Mellon and went to go work for Rally Software. Anyone heard of Rally? Anyone use Rally? Hands up still? OK, great. So um, uh, I was the head of uh, director of analytics and research for Rally. My team was responsible for all the charting and analytics uh, capabilities inside of Rally. But my real passion and the reason I went to go work for Rally was that I got to crawl around the database of tens of thousands of teams. And from that, I published the largest ever study correlating practices, everything from iteration length to geographic distribution to gender diversity, um, correlating those practices, those decisions that you could make with outcomes 
like productivity, predictability, quality, responsiveness, and security. So that's how I'm well known. Most of my talks that I've given in the past five or six years have really been centered around um, that, that work. Um, I'm, I'm sort of launching new work with this DevSecOps stuff here. Um, I'm still an active developer. I have a dozen or so open source projects I manage. I believe it's really important that you're, if you're advising developers, you have to be an active developer. Um, so even though I'm a director level or senior director level at Comcast, they wouldn't normally be expected to write a lot of code. I'm literally writing code every day, but most of it is on my open source projects. One of those open source projects gets over 200,000 downloads a month, so a pretty popular project. If you're uh, familiar at all with the uh, Node.js world, um, you may, may actually be using one of my, one of my projects there. Um, so now I work at Comcast. I'm the uh, director of... Uh, DevSecOps transformation at Comcast, and this talk is sort of based on some of the learnings from that, but also goes all the way back to my days at Carnegie Mellon. So I mentioned the Build Security In initiative, and, and, and that it was somewhat disappointing, the results of that. It, it didn't really take off. And there were maybe 50 companies or so that adopted it. Um, Gary McGraw turned it into a nice business and, and recently sold out for a lot of money, um, that business, but, uh, but it didn't really change the world, so to speak. Um, and I think the reason for that was that security, the best way to influence security at the time, this was a decade or so ago, the best way to influence security was really in the hands of the operations folks, the infrastructure folks. That was where you'd get the biggest bang for the buck if you made an investment in tooling or practices were at the infrastructure level. Um, and without DevOps, without the development teams, um, build security in is all talking to developers, they really didn't have a lot of, a lot of uh, influence over the real security of their product. DevOps changes that fundamentally. Developers now have a hand in operations, and anything that, that they, they can do to improve operations, including security, um, is going to actually now have more of an impact. So what I'm doing now is, is my talks now and the book I'm working on now, the product I'm working on now, the company I'm trying to spin up out of all of this is focused on actually taking the ideas from a decade ago and packaging them in a way that can actually be consumed um, uh, and actually accomplish what I set out to do a decade or so ago, uh, change the world and have this be the norm for development. So um, DevOps changes things. Development doesn't just ship once a quarter, or once a month, or once a week. It's several times a day they're pushing to production. The old concepts of security, and even operations folks too, of gating to production until the product passes some validation, those concepts are essentially dead in my mind. They still persist. They haven't gone away, but they're no longer going to work. There's no way that you can keep up with the pace of that. The whole message of DevOps is to make it such that a developer can make a, a code change that can run the gauntlet of tests that you've put in place, and the tests become the validation, and the automated tests become the validation, as opposed to some operations group doing configuration and, to, and validating that, and then a, a, a security testing group doing validation and doing that. So there's no longer a gating approach is gonna work. We have to involve the developers in securing the products now. And, and so that's, that's really the key to making this happen. Let's take a step back, though, and let's talk about sort of poke down about what I mean when I say DevOps. So um, what, do you, what do you think of when you hear DevOps? What does DevOps mean to you? you should just shout it out here. Agile say again? Agile system, Agile system administration. So still sysadmins, but they're more agile. OK? Other, other thoughts? Same team that's getting closer to where, the way I think about it. Very good. And you had something back here. Continuous delivery. Continuous delivery. So automation, tooling um, is part of that. But also, the, you, you, you didn't say tools. You didn't say CICD tools. You said continuous delivery, the idea that you can actually push to production very rapidly. Very key aspect of DevOps. More? Any other thoughts? 
Business value, very good. Other thoughts? Yeah, so these are all some of the ones I've got listed here. Um, some folks like to think of it as a new role. There's a DevOps group now, which is really just a new name for the old sysadmin or the old ops group sometimes. Um, but then now they're expected to write scripts to do a lot of stuff that they used to do manually. So they're DevOps now. That does not meet my definition. That's very far from my definition. That's sort of a, a lipstick on a pig definition in my mind. Um, partnership, more communication. It's getting a little closer, a little better, uh, but it's not quite there between those. Um, CICD tools, definitely important part of it, the tooling part of it. Automation uh, is, 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 is the message there. Self-service is the message there. Um, some techniques like feature flags or traffic shaping are also part of it, trunk-based development. We're going to talk about that in a minute. Move fast and break things. That's what I, I think you're getting at with continuous delivery. Um, and so the last one here is culture change, systems thinking, continuous improvement, value delivery. Those are the, and, the, and the stuff that was mentioned back here, those are really getting at what I think of when I think of DevOps. So this is my definition of DevOps. Um, it, I, I will honor other folks' definitions. I, I, I like a lot of other folks' definitions, but this is the one that I, I tend to gravitate towards the most. That DevOps is just empowered engineering teams taking ownership of how their product performs in production. Empowered engineering teams. You said it's all one team, and that's exactly what I mean um, that, by this, is that it's a single entity that takes ownership of how their product performs in production collectively. There's no throwing it over the wall anymore to a different team. When you do this, you get fundamentally different decisions. Developer gets called in on a Saturday to deal with an issue. On Monday, he goes into his team planning meeting and he says, you know guys, if we had this one extra piece of information in the log and this one extra lever in the product, I could have carved out that bad behavior and left the good behavior running and I could have been in and out of there on a Saturday in five minutes. Somebody else on the team says, you know, Ops has been asking for those two same features for three years now. Well, why don't we implement it this quarter, though, or this sprint, though, because now that we're responsible for it, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna actually do things that will help the operation of our product. Fundamentally different decisions. So that's sort of a practice decision. That's sort of a prioritization decision change. Um, but there are engineering decisions that change. So uh, you, you know this Dos Equis guy? I don't always prefer beer, but when I do, I prefer... Dos Equis, right? Um, well, I don't always test, but when I do, it's in production. It's a little, my little flavor of that. So has anyone heard of Chaos Monkey? OK, someone want to tell me what Chaos Monkey is? Say again? Failure injection in production. That's a great definition of Chaos Monkey, especially because you said in production. Um, the original chaos monkey was the CEO walking into the server room and going, hey devs, watch this, and yanking the power cord from the wall and turning off the UPSs. Does our, did our system stay up? Oh, it did, they didn't stay up. Ah, the users are experiencing that right now. You better go fix it and make sure that doesn't happen next time I come yank the cord out of the wall. Um, that was literally sort of the start of the chaos monkey way of thinking. Is that a good thing? Sort of like Cortez burning the boats, right? So, you know, his, his, uh, his folks couldn't sail back, that they knew they had to make it in the new world, right? Um, no, yes? Why, why is it in production? Do you want to answer? Uh, yeah. He asked why is it in production. Yeah, so there's a lot of reasons for that. Your test system, your staging system, is never going to exactly be that. Your traffic that you run on the staging system is never going to exactly match the traffic that's in production. Plus, it's very costly to do overnight uh, performance testing runs and um, to 
maintain the cost of a separate parallel equally sized system that just for running these tests and just for running, running staging. Doing it in production means that yes, the first few times you do it, your users are gonna actually experience the pain. But what that does is that tells the development team that they have to change the way they develop. Not only in the architecture of the code that they write so that they're tolerant of these sorts of problems, which are gonna happen naturally anyway. Some uh, network connection is gonna go down. Maybe you didn't simulate exactly the way it went down in your test environment, but it's gonna go down. So you, you change your mindset of how you design when you, when you do that. So you get fundamentally better code that's much more robust, much more resilient to these sorts of problems. Um, but you also, and this is, I think, actually the more important message out of that doing it in production. You teach the development team, you, you, you sort of uh, program the development team to think roll forward fast. We're not going to roll back the code from yesterday. We're down right now. It's a network problem that's down. Roll forward fast. Roll out new code very quickly, minutes sometimes, that fixes that problem and restores us to production. And that teams then start to think, well, how can we go faster? What can we automate more? What can we parallelize about our automated testing? And so you actually get that sort of culture, cultural change to happen. And I, to me, that's the more important factor, is getting that cultural change to happen. It's really the burn the boats a mentality you're trying to instill in the, in the developers there. Great question, and thank you for your help with the answer. Um, so, um, when I think of the most mature practices in a DevOps environment, I think uh, of trunk-based development. So, how many of you have heard of trunk-based development? How many of you are doing what you think is trunk-based development in a robust way? So, you want to describe for us your, your system in the back there? Okay. So you've got a vault of some sort or something like that. Right. Okay, great. That's that's a great description of the technical the technical aspects of it and, and it, it's very well aligned with with, with my thinking as well. Um, to 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 differentiate trunk based development from GitHub flow, for instance. GitHub Flow sort of envisions long-running feature branches. I'm working on a feature, a new feature to the product. It's going to take me weeks, me and a small group of folks maybe, weeks to actually implement this feature. We don't want a partially implemented feature out there in production, so we're going to put it on a feature branch, and then every day or so, we're going to pull down from trunk, because other folks are working on different feature branches, and we're going to make sure that we synchronize with that, and if our changes conflict with theirs, we'll resolve those conflicts in our branch. That's called GitHub Flow, and the, Git Flow is a little different, but, but a similar sort of concept. You have these long-running feature branches, in trunk-based development, you do not have long-running feature branches. You do everything in trunk. Well, how do you prevent the user from then seeing these partially completed features? You do that by putting those features behind a toggle, or a flag, and some people call it, or by using traffic shaping to only route certain traffic to the version of the, of the, the, the release that has that partially completed feature in it. Um, so uh, this is a fundamentally different, well, let me describe what a flag is. So a flag is essentially an if statement in your code. Um, if the user that I'm talking to right now, or that's trying to send this request into me, is of a certain type of user, I'm going to show him the feature. And if he's not of that type of uh, user, I'm not going to show him that feature. 
And the, the definition of which type of user is a dial, really. You start with just the internal developers, then you start with, then you turn the dial up to the internal developers plus the testing group, and then you turn the dial up to the internal developers plus the testing group plus every user in our company if you happen to be dog fooding your own product. And then you turn it up to include alpha testers, and then you turn it up to include beta testers, and, and, then, you, and then you turn it up to only include 5% of your production traffic, and, and then you, you slowly ramp it up. So that dial gets to be turned up slowly, and you're constantly testing in production the same exact code. And, and you don't turn the dial past um, alpha users till the feature is, is, is done, and you might not even turn it to alpha users until you think it's done or you're cl close to done. And then you'll get feedback from those users to help improve it. Um, this allows multiple features to be in various different states, this toggling approach. But it's messy. Um, you have all these if statements in your code that you have to then go back and remove after the, the dial has been turned all the way up. The dial is usually controlled by you know, engineering up to a certain point, and then it's controlled by marketing after that point. So you've got this extra coordination that have to do with marketing to decide when they, they're going to announce the feature and they're going to turn it on. So, so it, 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 is, it is more work. It's not less work. But once you do that work once and you get into the pattern of doing this, you can then ship to production out of a main trunk, a single based, a single trunk. So now that I've described my, what I think of as trunk-based development, how, how many hands say they're still doing trunk-based development? One guy, in the, two, there we go. Two, and someone doing their nose. Is that a, I kind of think, no. okay, so two, two folks. So, so, so that's, um, that's a, a pretty mature practice. It's a very mature practice. Uh, I was at that level with Rally. Rally actually implemented this about five or six years ago, maybe a little more than that now, actually, more like six or seven years ago. Uh, we had trunk-based development. We had feature toggles. Um, and we had to evolve our practices around those to really make it be a production. And it allowed Rally to ship features a lot faster after we implemented that. Um, so this is uh, basically what I've been saying here. Um, yeah, OK. So um, runtime switchable, there's usually a database that says this, this user is of this type, um, and this toggle is in this state. Um, there's, uh, th this is sometimes not just used for uh, enabling development, but it's used to sort of do experiments. You can have two alternative uh, versions of a feature, you know, one with color scheme A and one with color scheme B, and you can see which users end up uh, adopting it and giving it better reviews uh, based on that. So it's not just for engineering purposes. Um, Comcast has a, a product in-house that we use uh, for doing this, uh, and so it, it, it's called the Appli Application Discovery Service, bad name, um, for a feature toggle capability because it also does application discovery. It was original intent. Now it does application toggling as well. Um, traffic shaping is really more, it's the same concept in general, but it's really more appropriate for microservices where you're not going to have a lot of parallel edits going on. Um, so if you have a single microservice, you're not going to have sort of feature A being added and feature by one team and feature B being added by another team to the same microservice in most cases. Um, and what you'll do is you'll have 10 servers out there, and one of them will have the um, new version on it, and the other nine will have the old version on it. And you just route users to which server based upon what the toggle setting is. Still usually database backed. It's uh, so um, uh, common for microservices and APIs, uh, traffic shaping, um, rules engine based backend as well. Um, Comcast has actually open sourced our implementation of this. Um, it's called the XRE Guide uh, Redirector Traffic Shaping Router. So if you want an example of that, that, that is something that we've open sourced and is available to the community. We're giving back to the community for that. Um, so that's DevOps. What's DevSecOps? Um, actually, I'm going you know, to cruise through this, this section really quick um, and get to the tools part because we're, we're almost out of time here. Um, DevSecOps is essentially the same definition except with the security emphasized. 
Um, I've got some content here around, um, you know, what I mean by culture shift, a uh, thing I call the DevSecOps manifesto. And I've got some content here that I went over yesterday that was uh, uh, called the pledge that is basically how I think um, security teams should be working with developers. Uh, and, and this content called the trust algorithm, um, there's a, a download, a link there to a, a blog series about it as well. Um, but let's move on to tools. So this is my DevOps continuum. Um, and I've grafted over the top of this sort of my vision for tools in this space. The first tool I want to mention, the industry analysts call software composition analysis, or SCA. Um, SCA is essentially looking at your bill of materials of your dependencies, looking at the version of which dependency you're looking for, and going out to public databases to see if there's any publicly reported vulnerabilities against that version. Then it tells you which version you need to upgrade to to get away from that vulnerability. Um, they're actually very uh, reliable tools. They're easy to install. They give you great results, very, very low false positive rates, um, very trouble-free operation. Very, they run very quickly, so they're very appropriate in a DevOps pipeline. I have yet to see um, a single SEA tool that I think is lipstick on a pig. Uh, just about every SEA tool out there can be run in a DevOps pipeline because they run so quickly. For all of these reasons, plus because I think they provide you with the biggest bang for your buck, I think you should start with a robust SCA tool integration. If you don't have an SCA tool running in your pipeline today, go back to the office, mention to your manager that Equifax was burned because they didn't have a good SCA tool and practice around it, and you will get money to go implement an SCA tool in your pipeline. And I recommend you do this as soon as you leave here. It's my strongest, uh, most obvious, uh, unhedged recommendation here. Um, we, we've evaluated a number of SCA tools. Um, there's very little differentiation between the results they give you in, in reality, so it, it doesn't necessarily matter too much what you pick. Some of them are a lot easier to integrate than others, though. So if you want a, a specific tool recommendation, come up to me as, afterwards or reach out to me on LinkedIn, and, and I'll be glad to give you a, a, a more direct answer there. The next category of tools, and this is sort of more the traditional security tools. Tools like Fortify are called static analysis tools or SAST tools. Um, and, and they are troublesome. They're troublesome because they're harder to get installed and running correctly. They're, but they're mostly troublesome because they give a lot of false positives which waste your time and, and cause you frustration and you basically lose trust in the tool then. So there's a competitive kind of tool that uses a similar kind of analysis but doesn't suffer from the same false positive rate problem that static analysis tools. The reason static analysis tools are so high false positives is that they're approximating the data flow analysis by looking at your source code. I asked tools don't approximate the data flow analysis. They actually calculate it for real tr test traffic or real production traffic. Then they then go back and do similar source sanitized sync analysis that static analysis tools are doing. You don't need to send an attack request response for an IAS tool to work. Unlike a dynamic analysis tool, which requires you to send a pretend attack to your product in order for it to find the problem. You can send regular old traffic to an IAS tool and it'll still find vulnerabilities in your code. So IAS tools are favored over SCA tools and they be they're basically looking for the same kind of problems. So I've lumped them together into a category I've called primary code analysis or analysis for code written. The first bucket was analysis for code imported or analysis for code included. Um, and so these are the two ca the gr groups that I think are the most important. There are others that I think are, 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 are sort of out there, but they're very troublesome for DevOps environments. Um, dynamic analysis takes long time to run. Um, if you want to use a dynamic analysis tool, if you're already using a dynamic analysis tool, I recommend you pull it out of the gating function that you not include it in the gauntlet that your product has to run to get into production. Run them after the artifact is already in production and use that feedback after the fact in the next dev cycle. That's why it's sort of grayed out because it's not actually run in cycle here. The next category of tools is fuzzing. Again, also takes a long time to run, also grayed out. 
Um, it's a, t a form of dynamic analysis. Dyna the first kind of dynamic analysis is trying to attack your product. Let's pretend to inject a SQL injection. Let's see if your product is susceptible to that. Fuzzing, though, doesn't really try to attack your product um, directly. All it does is send random data to your product. Maybe if it's a name character, a name field you're only expecting 50 characters in, it'll send 5,000 characters to it and see how your product behaves. It'll send funky Unicode characters that maybe you didn't expect and see how your product behaves. So fuzzing is really good for APIs and protocols to see how robust they are when somebody's trying to do a denial of service attack against them, against you. Um, runtime application security protection, RASP tools. Now these, I think, are, they're still grayed out in my diagram here, but I'm getting ready to turn this one into color here. Um, I, I think there's now some RASP tools out there that I think development teams can really get their heads around um, that are, they're not like an application firewall, they're actually more like the IaaS tools that I talked about, except you run them in production. And those RASP tools will actually block attack traffic uh, 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 against your, your product. Um, so this is the, the version of the slide you probably want to take the picture of. I know you guys have been taking incremental pictures. Um, by the way, if you want the slides, connect with me on LinkedIn and mention this particular talk, and I'll, I'll send you the slide deck for this talk. I have given the slides to Spring One, though, so there's probably some way for you to download it, um, uh, but probably not today. Uh, I, gave, I just gave the latest version of the slides to the gentleman in the back of the room when I walked in the room earlier. So um, that's essentially the content, and I'm already two minutes over, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna cruise past this here. Uh, there's some, some, some write-ups of, I've said most of this stuff as, as we've gone through it. Um, uh, so you can, you can refer back to it in the, in the slide deck when you, when you, when you get a chance. Um, I do wanna mention that this is a cumulative flow diagram of, of findings, and I think this is the best visualization for actually managing your, your backlog of vulnerability findings. So we've designed this at Comcast to pull the data using the APIs out of all of the scanning tools we've got running. Um, and the idea here is that when a new, new finding is found, it goes into this pink, orangish bucket. Um, when it's resolved, it goes into the green bucket. And if it's marked as a false positive, it goes into the blue bucket. And you can look at it over time. And you really want this green line to approach this orange line. And you want to make sure this false positive line isn't growing very rapidly. Um, so, so really, uh, very quickly, easily, you can diagnose with a visualization like this. Um, I did not plan well with the timing of this, so uh, sorry about that, guys. I had only 30 slides, but I went slower than I thought. So uh, we're out of time for questions. Here's the uh, link to the trust algorithm I mentioned earlier, and um, a link to LinkedIn. I'll be here uh, afterwards if you want to come up, but everybody else, uh, you know, thank you very much.